What's up, everybody? Before we get into this week's interview, you know, we're diving behind the scenes of the business of fantasy football. We have a, a fantastic guest. Grant Barfield is the managing editor of all fantasy football content over at NFL.com. You guys are going to learn a ton from this interview. I know I did. I had a great time talking with Graham. I wanted to apologize for a few things up front. I know my like video, audio, delay, lag, whatever you techie people want to call it, has been a little spotty, uh, to, to put it lightly, for the last few episodes. <clears throat> this one as well. The video from Graham's side, not his fault, my fault for my recording software is a little bit choppy. The audio should come in perfectly. I know there's a little bit of echo within the first like 10 seconds, but after that, it should be all good on the audio side. So I don't know if you want to watch us get chopped up and whatnot, but uh, but you can listen to it, open a new tab or whatever. What we say is what's important. The content within there is really, really good. And I never really ask you for anything when I do these, but I know a lot of you guys you know, get a lot of value from it. So all I would ask is that you share it with other people um, in your life, whether it's your friends friends, your family, if you think that they would get some valuable uh, information from it, if you think that they'd be inspired or motivated to, you know, start or do something based off of some of these interviews, that's all I ask is to share this with them. I don't care about the view counts or the subscriber numbers or whatever, but if you think this will bring value to other people in your life, that's what it's all about. We're here to inspire. We're here to get inspired. And that's what this interview is. So shout out to Graham. Graham, I'm an asshole. I'm sorry. I wish I got the recording better. I think I figured out what the problem was and it will be better for next week's interview. So sit back, stop yelling, tuck your shirt in and let's get to it. Hi, we live in Big Dogs. Welcome, Welcome back, back to the HQ. To Man's Nicholas. Big Dogs got to eat fantasy football, and it is Monday, so you know we're diving behind the scenes of the fantasy football industry. We have an awesome guest today. Uh, we have Mr. Graham Barfield. That's where you can find him on Twitter without the Mr. part. And, you know, when I started this series of, of interviewing people, I'm not that far into it, but when I first, first started, uh, you know, there's a few people that kind of popped on my mind of who I wanted to bring on for this. And you had to have been within the first like two or three names that really pop into my head. Uh, so getting you on to here is, is really, really, really awesome. And uh, you've been a very big inspiration to to me as someone who's trying to, you know, build a brand and come up into the industry. And I've seen a lot of the, you know, I followed you for, for years now. And I've seen a lot of the work you've done and just like how you've progressed as not just a person, but a writer and and all of these things. So uh, super, super, super happy to, uh, to have you on for the interview today, Graham. Uh, say what's up to the people and kind of introduce yourself and, Give them a little background of, of your fantasy knowledge. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you. I uh, appreciate you having me on the show. Pretty cool to have an opportunity to come on and like talk about not just fantasy, but real life stuff. Um, I think that like obviously having uh, having the background in this industry and being in it for now, this is about to be my eighth year. Um, I've definitely learned a lot and grown a lot and made mistakes and learned from them. Um, so I think it's really cool how you kind of, started the show where you intertwine not only fantasy knowledge, but also um, real life stuff. And, you know, I'm excited to be a part of it. And it's, it's pretty cool, man. Yeah, dude, I'm super excited. I think you're going to give a, a very unique perspective um, because a lot of the guys in our industry are, uh, you know, you've seen some of my interviews. They're, they're of the older demographic for the most part, but we are seeing it trying to kind of transition um, down or at least there are a lot of new players in the game because I think a, a lot of the, the brand building that goes into it, um, being a, a player in the creative space, whether that's fantasy or whatever it is, um, is is being successfully built by people who who know how to navigate, you know, Twitter and Instagram and things like that. Um, so, you know, that being said, like, I'm not even sure how, how old you are. How, let the people know, because I have a lot of younger uh, people yeah. in the audience, so I'm sure they're they're kind of dying to know, like, you know, how quickly can I come up into, you know, work yeah. for the NFL and whatnot? Yeah, I'm 24. Um, wow. I, okay. Yeah, I originally started writing in college. Um, in 2013, I just kind of made a Twitter account and didn't really know what I was doing at first. Uh, so I started like a blog and just wrote random like one-off pieces about certain players or like uh, values for fantasy or whatever. And it all sucked. I mean, looking back on it now, like going back and reading <laughs> some stuff I was writing in 2013 yep. and 14. Uh, and the tweets I was writing, it sucked. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, but it kind of laid the groundwork of, um, you know, I think some success I've had recently. Um, so yeah, I've been around for a while. Um, bounced around in a lot of different places and worked with a lot of really cool people and a lot of cool groups. Um, like I mentioned, first kind of started by just creating a Twitter account, writing my own blog. Um, got picked up by Numberfire and, and JJ Zacharyson and that crew in about late 2014. 
I uh, wrote with JJ and Number Fire for about a year and a half, um, then moved on to Roto World for about three years, and in that time, kind of worked on their draft guide. Uh, did some various like in-season columns, out of off-season columns. Um, it, it also, was a contributor to Fantasy Labs before they got converted into Action Network. Um, and then, like summer 2016, I was graduating college with a finance degree with no money in my pocket, and like was trying to make it full-time in the fantasy industry. Uh, it happened to, to be at that time, Roto World was not offering it any full-time position, so I had one last chance. Uh, FantasyGuru.com, run by John Hansen, mm-hmm. was looking for a full-time fantasy analyst, and I jumped at the opportunity and, and luckily luckily got it. Um, was there for about two and a half years, and then um, now I'm over at the NFL. It's been kind of a, it's been a wild ride, man. It's taken a lot of twists and turns. Um, and I, I certainly, at certain points, didn't think I'd make it full time in the fantasy because it is so freaking hard. Um, but yeah, it, it's been a wild ride. That's yeah, for sure. And you say you would you wouldn't make it in fantasy. Like you're 24 years old, you could have not made it for another five years and still made it way earlier than 90 percent of the people in the uh, in the industry. But yeah, I forgot to kind of like introduce where you're at right now. You're currently mm-hmm. uh, make sure I get this title right. The managing editor for all fantasy football content over at NFL.com, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm not one for titles, but it, um, but yeah, that I, I was originally just basically an analyst, and for whatever reason, they decided to let me <laughs> let me manage and, and edit articles on a uh, on a pretty big basis. Um, yeah. I feel very fortunate, very lucky to do it. Yeah, dude, I, that's uh, surprising. I didn't realize you were 24. I, I would have pegged you maybe like 27 or 28, just probably yeah. because in, in, when you say the amount of you know time you spent in the industry doing all these things for a year and a half, three years, whatever. And I don't think a lot of people understand the amount of work that goes in to get to like where you're at right now. You're 24 and you put in years and years and years and years of work. So like thinking back on that, right, at such a young age, what would you say if there is maybe one key thing or if there's a few key things that you would kind of throw into the pot and mix around uh, to be like the key pieces of, of success that have gotten you to where you're at now at such a young age? Well, from like from early on um, in college, I, like I mentioned, I was a finance major, right? And I never wanted to go through. I knew I never wanted to go through life and, and feel like I was working or feel like I was just trying to, to work and make a salary to make ends meet. I, I wanted to do something on my own and on my own way. And I always loved fantasy. Like I always loved football. Yep. Uh, I always loved sports. I always knew I wanted to do something in sports. And I've always said this is like. Even if I weren't doing football stuff full time, I would hope I would be doing something in sports full time. Um, and that was kind of always my goal. So I kept asking myself, like, you know, how do I achieve that? Like, how do I how do I become anything full time in sports? It could be an agent, um, anything. And, and I, for me, it was just trying to have like a long term perspective and a long term view of everything. So. I knew it would take me years. I knew it would take me four or five years if I really want to sink my teeth into you know, fantasy football full time. Um, at the time in 2013, 2014, it was still really, really new. And I felt like there was a big, big market to be exploited uh, within the analytics community, within the football community, within the stats community to kind of uh, have a voice that could not only um, provide cool stats that are predictive, but also provide context to them. So I kind of set out to have this like long-term view of like, okay, if I'm going to do this on my own and I really want to have like, um, you know, never feel like I'm working and, and just kind of like kind of work for myself my whole life, I, I've got to have a long-term mindset of everything. Um, so for me, I, I try to not sweat anything in the short term. Like, I think I think in this in today's day and age and like in this society, I think. People are obsessed with instant gratification. They're they're obsessed yeah. with with getting likes and retweets immediately and, and follows on YouTube, whatever. Um, and I think if you just have a mindset where you're going to think for the long term and you're thinking of exploiting or finding a new way, a new pathway into whatever industry you're you're going into, um, it's going to serve you because if you if you're thinking of things just a little bit differently than everyone else. Um, and you think of it for the long term, you're not just focused on just short term goals and just short term likes, retweets, whatever the case may be. Like you have you'll ha- you'll set yourself up for something that's more sustainable over the years instead of just a few months. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like anytime I was starting to do something new, whether it was like, yeah, I want to start posting more on this platform or I want to start building more over here. 
it's always like that new kind of weird feeling. But I've always I've always been someone who's better at at seeing things from uh, a bigger picture and definitely looking long term and knowing like you that I, I need to put in years of work to see any sort of ROI on on the hard work that I'm going to be putting into. And of course, the bottom, you know, the common denominator of, of putting in the hard work is it has to be high quality work. You have to be good if you're going to get somewhere. But I think like people need to, to understand that it takes a lot of time. You have to be looking long term. Like I'm, I'm so long term to the point where like I, I just I forget shit on, on the regular, like small things that I need to get done. Small details are are not me. And that's why I try to like put off those small things to other people around me, um, whoever can take on more work, whatever it is, uh, to the point that, you know, it, it's only me looking at, at the bigger picture. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really strong strong point and you know I, I would say one of the most important things in in today's like world is being able to brand yourself right like you can come up with that twist or that spin on whatever it is that you want to do and like you said there's a ton of opportunity and you said you saw it years ago which is great because i still see it now i mean the fantasy industry is we're still here and and like it's yeah. going to get up here within the next few years you know so there's going to be new platforms new uh, formats, dynasty, best ball, all of these things that someone out there can become like the go-to guy for that stuff. And the way I think you do that is by putting in the work, but also building this personal brand where when people think of a uh, specific, like for instance, like with your yards creative stuff, when I think of college running backs, like your, your, that resource is the first thing that I want to look at to understand like how good these players are. And there's a lot of different people that have that stigma in my mind for what I go to. So in terms of like personal brand, would you say like building, your, you know, your Twitter following, which is obviously getting like exponentially bigger as these summers go by, would you say like that has, is really what kind of skyrocketed you to all of these like kind of powerful positions along the way? I, I can firmly say if I didn't have Twitter, I wouldn't have my job. <laughs> exactly. I mean, seriously, like I, I owe a lot of pretty much my whole career to have a Twitter. Um, because it is such a, it's really the final social media platform that's a true like timeline and it's just kind of an open thread platform. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, obviously I've, I've got you know six, seven year head start on, on a lot of people, but, but yeah, like one, one thing I always thought about too is like life is not a meritocracy. Like you might be so much better and so much more talented and have better ideas than the people ahead of you. I'm putting it ahead of you in air quotes, but over the long term, if you have the right mindset and you have your thinking for the long term, good people will eventually get the right jobs. Right. It just takes time. And what I think is really cool with you and like with YouTube in general, like there's just not much of a fancy football presence on YouTube. No. So you coming up right now as YouTube is kind of exploding, you know, the last three, four years, especially the last two, yep. to kind of fill this like niche, like this niche void of like. There's no fan, there's no good fantasy football content on YouTube. There's no go-to guy for someone to go to on YouTube to get waiver wire advice, but also you know, talk about stuff like this. I think that's that's more or less the mindset that you you've got to have, and I think that's that's you know kind of what you're going for here. Yeah, 100. percent Because I mean, at the end of the day, like I'll look back in a few years when I've built a big following on YouTube, and I'll say, yeah, I got lucky because I got on YouTube before you know anyone was there, and that's why it worked for me. But you're gonna look at the people before me that got on Twitter early and they're going to say the same thing. And you're going to look at the people who got on podcasting early. They're going to say the same thing just because I, you know, kind of got in with the new wave doesn't mean it's any better or any worse. It's just different. And you have to always keep your mind open to like how these platforms are going to evolve. Right. And, and to that point too, like even if you do miss, like I got lucky with timing, right? 2013, 2014. We, we all say it, but you didn't get, you didn't get lucky. Like you wouldn't like, listen, we all got lucky, but I would never yeah. say someone who has been that successful is a lucky person. Cause I understand how much hard work goes into it, you know? Well, I, yeah, I appreciate that. But there is, there is a timing mechanism to it. Right. I will say if you, if you aren't one of the ones that like, like right now on Twitter, it is, I would, I can't imagine what it's like to try to come up through the fantasy industry right now. You can't. On Twitter, um, I won't say you can't, and that's kind of where I was going with this, is like, if you have a different mindset, you have a different approach and like a different way that you view football, it can be either through film, data, like your strategy, whatever, like if you have to have a contrarian and different mindset and a different way to approach the game, because frankly, Nick, like, who cares about my start sit advice? Like anyone Facts. can write start sit yeah. advice. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like anyone can write about waiver wire advice. Like I, I do it still because it's such a just a normal embedded part 
of the fantasy industry and our, you know, our base, our readers want to hear it. They, they have to hear it. We, we have to have waiver wire advice. You have to have star city advice. But the way to think of things differently is like, okay, I have a problem. I want to either solve it, you know, this way or the other. What is a different way I can view this content? What is a, view, a different way to do start set? What's a different way to do waiver wire? Um, and make it actionable, but also like easily consumable because there's there's so much content that can be written around the NFL, around fantasy sports in general. And if you just take it from and think of it from a different lens, like okay, here's the start sit column that I can make super basic and just give you the you know the top five six starts and sits, or can I spin it and make it original and make it actionable and consumable? I think that's the biggest differentiator. Is like I don't say it's not hard. It's, I won't, I won't, I'll grant you because I, I've been, the, I've been around long enough. Like I, I would assume it's very, very hard to come up on Twitter, but don't say you can't because if you have a different mindset and you have a different perspective on how to do things in fantasy, there are so, so many different ways and so many platforms to get that message out now. Like, yeah, you're I, right. I, you're right. There are many different platforms, but that's why I say you can't do it on Twitter. Like if you, if, if you go in with the mindset that you're going to create a Twitter account and build your platform off that, I don't, I really, in my, in my heart of hearts, I don't think it's possible right now. I think okay, you could I do agree. it successfully funneling, being an influencer marketer for yourself, like myself, like I have a much bigger following on YouTube. So I say, yo, go follow me on Twitter. So then when you see me on Twitter, I have the 3000, 4000 followers, but those, most of them are from, you know, from YouTube. So the way I would look at it is you're right. You have to approach it from a different perspective. Like like you said, like film or whatnot. But when you go to the, the whole like film thing, most of the guys that are coming up that are really good breaking down the film, like Matt Waldman, for instance, he's doing that through YouTube now. You know what I mean? Like Twitter is yeah. not really his platform. So it's really about understanding what the difference is and trying to kind of deliver it in a different way. I also think that sheer volume is a good approach. Like maybe you don't have to have one main platform, but if you could put stuff out on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube, you know, all at once, it's very hard to do without a team of people. But if you can, if you're willing to put the work in, I think that's another way to get ahead. And I, I think a big mistake people make, especially on Twitter, and I think you're really good at this, is when you tweet, you tweet with a purpose, right? 99.9% yes. .9 of, of things that you tweet out are like really good statistics and facts that you find on players that are valuable to people. And you see, like, I don't, I don't think I follow a single brand on Twitter. Like, I wouldn't follow, you know, Roto Wire or whatever, because all they do is take their articles on their website and tweet out the link. I'm like, that's not valuable to anyone. You have to be able to take the context of the platform that you're on and post stuff there. And I think, like, for instance, Instagram is a fantastic platform to grow on for fantasy football. People will have some stigma towards it because it's new school and whatnot. But if you can make nice vertical pictures and do the same write-ups that you have in your blog posts, put that into a 2,000 character post on Instagram, that's still really valuable for people. And there's no peop there's no one on that really doing it. So like, talk to me about about your thinking behind Twitter because like I can't yo I can't even go on Twitter on football on Sunday because everyone needs to like tweet out a player's name if they score a touchdown. It's out of control. I'm with you too, by the way. I don't go on Twitter on Sundays either just because I lose my mind. Same. Also, it's, it's kind of nice just to watch the games without any like unnecessary reactionary comments. Yeah, um, but yeah, my thoughts on Twitter are, are pretty simple. Like I just view it as a tool. And I asked myself like years ago, you know, I knew I, years ago I was, I had some really cool stats um, that I was tweeting out and uh, I was kind of the same thing as you, just going for volume, right? But I noticed like my following just kind of was stagnating and like I just wasn't growing the way I wanted to. So I started asking myself, is like, why should anyone want to follow me? Right. Like I, why why would anyone follow me? For me, like I just all, I came back to that question. It's like I, I not only want to have a different voice within the industry, but also I want to do things my own way. So for me, I, I just sunk back into like, why should anyone want to follow me? And I just kind of decided to take this brand of like I want to be a source for somebody to go to that can not only find like actionable fantasy information, but a lot of the stuff that I feel like I tweet out can be broadly applied to just like real football. Um, and I think finding some sort of segue in between like making yourself a marketable fantasy mind, but also you can do some NFL stuff that will appeal to just more of a broader audience. I think that's kind of how I came up um, throughout the industry and like, 
I think so many people, like you mentioned, don't post or write without a purpose. They're just kind of, they're just kind of aimlessly firing. Like back in the day, that's what I would do. I would just aimlessly fire stats. I just aimlessly and I'm, fire. I'm okay with that. Like, I'm okay yeah. with people tweeting out, you know, like the way I look at my brand too is I like it more as a lifestyle brand, but mm -hmm. like a lot of people are like, oh, I want to start a lifestyle brand. Let me slap a logo on a t-shirt or whatever. But like, that's not a lifestyle brand. A lifestyle brand is giving you valuable content through stuff like, like this, you know? So it's like, right. you can tweet out whatever you want, but if it's not entertaining or if it's not valuable from like an information standpoint, right. like you need to like double think about that, you know, like really take a step back. Think of it this way, like we're, we're humans, right? We want to, like you mentioned, we either want to be entertained, we want to laugh, or we want to find something insightful. Right. And for me, my brand is always, I just want to be insightful. That doesn't mean being the smartest person in the room. That doesn't mean being not being wrong, because I'm wrong all the time. It just means I wanted to be able to provide information that can be easily consumable, but it's also like pretty analytically driven and numbers based. It's not just me. Here's Graham Barfield's week eight start sit advice, because anyone yes. can do that. <laughs> anyone can do that. But I think thinking of things differently and again, thinking of building a brand for the long term um, and having a contrarian mindset is, is definitely helped uh, kind of help foster this crazy little thing I have. Yeah, no, you do a really good job. And there are very few people in the industry that really stick to their guns because I'm even guilty of it. Like there are a lot of times if I put out new content, so I'm, if I'm posting five videos a week, you know, I want to make sure that the few thousand people on Twitter see it and click through. But it's like, it's, I get it. It's fucking annoying to people that are following me. And I'm like, you know what? If I'm looking at myself from an outside point of view, I don't want that. Like, I think it's yeah. really important to be native to whatever platform you're on. Don't use this, the same stuff, the same content on every platform. Otherwise, you know, that's how you, like you said, get stagnant and stop growing with it. Yeah. One of my biggest problems early in my career, I, I felt like I had was, again, like I, I could come up with really cool stats, but I had no idea how to contextualize it, and I had no idea how to market it. Um, so for me, I, I, it kind of circled back to like, why would anyone want to follow me? It's like, okay, I can have the coolest stats, and I can have some great ideas, but if I have no idea how to write, because at the time I had no idea how to write, right. if I had no idea how to market myself, or like you mentioned, think of myself as a brand instead of just someone aimlessly tweeting. Um, yeah. yeah, you've got to, you've got to have some sort of focus and drive and efficiency to your work as opposed to just like pointing and shooting aimlessly. Yeah, I know. That's why it's like, if you don't have a clear path, if you don't even know who you are and like what your brand is going to be out uh, be about, it's going to be very hard to navigate what you like really want to say. And I want to kind of circle back to something you brought up before. It's like, um, you know, like, oh, I do the waiver wires and I do the sit starts because that's just, you know, it's, it's like going through the motions if, if you do something in the fantasy industry. And I find myself the same thing. Like, I, dr I, I don't like putting out those videos throughout the year, especially. And it feels like I'm doing it because I have to and I do it. And those videos get thousands and thousands of views every week. And I'm like, well, this is the way to grow. And I kind of have to adapt to it. But just like a personal question, if you could only write about like, if you didn't have to do that kind of stuff, if, if you're focusing on fantasy still, but like you could choose kind of any topic or any content, what would you focus on specifically? Well, at the NFL, I mean, I'm super lucky that I get to work with like the next gen stats team. And if yeah. I could make like 90% of my articles just next gen stats based, like either just, you know, diving into their metrics because I mean, there's so much more I have to explore there. Yep. Uh, diving into their metrics, not just from a real football perspective, but relating it also back to fantasy. I think that's kind of where I would like to go. But I still do that, though. Like I, like I mentioned, I'm very lucky to have the resource of Next Gen Stats and, and Pro Football Focus at my fingertips. But with right. that said, like I can still do waiver wire advice and start sit advice that's a little bit different than the industry because I'm, I want to be able to use it and not just tell you, go pick up Jeff Wilson Jr. because Matt Breida's hurt. <laughs> yes. I want to show you why, like because Kyle Shanahan's like, consistently great with his running back. It's like yep. you can always take your analysis to the next step. and not being complacent in this industry is like the number one thing that I have found and not being complacent in general in, in life. is like, you can always, you can always seek out additional truth. You can always push yourself to, to, to change your opinion based on new information. And I think that's kind of what it comes down to is its core is like, I, at, at its core, I do not want to just sit around and do start set advice every single week or yeah. whatever. I don't think, I don't I think anyone does. does. No, but I can think of it a little bit differently and make it not only more entertaining for myself because I'll actually want to do it, but make it more usable and more marketable 
and more consumable for for my readers. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, uh, the market has a good way of kind of evening that out too. If you get complacent, there are always going to be younger people, better people, faster people than you are that are, you know, gunning for your spot. So if you're not good enough, the audience yep. will eventually work that yep. out for you in the long run. Exactly. Life is not a meritocracy, but in the long run, mm -hmm. good people get good jobs. Facts. <laughs> All right, so we we kind of talked about. Sorry, audience members out there, we had a little hiccup with the video. Uh, we, we talked about building a personal brand. Now, I think like building a personal brand, you definitely have to have some uh, kind of like entrepreneurial traits to you because you're you're you know it's you going out on your own and you're building something up from your own. And so it's like your baby, your personal brand, your reputation. Now, something you've built up on your own has been. This, this Yards Created column of yours, and now it's on YardsCreated.com. It's housed there. Uh, and I was saying to the audience members before, Yards Created is, uh, why don't you give them like a quick breakdown of, of what it is for some of the people that might not be familiar with it? Yeah, so Yards Created is like this thing I started in 2015 that basically like, it's essentially, at its core, it's basically just how does a running back perform independent of his offensive line? And... Um, Essentially, I take the offensive line's yardage blocked on a, any given play and then subtract out um, the yards created that the running back creates on his own. So it's a little bit different than yards after contact because yards after contact is, I think, a little bit like there's some there's some little bit like in between like yards after contact would be if Nick Chubb just gets touched at the line of scrimmage, is that after contact? Yeah, I mean, there's I just, like that. There's, there, there's a little bit of like – I don't know. There's a little bit. It's just yards after contact is a little bit open to interpretation. So for me, I started yards created just because I thought yards after contact was a little bit open to interpretation. And I've discovered that yards created is also open to interpretation too. But yeah, I started yards created in 2016. Um, it's kind of bounced around in a different, bunch of different places. It was at Rotor World and Guru for two years, and now I'm lucky enough to just do it on my own. I can do yards created on my own at yardscreated.com, um, and uh, yeah, we'll start. Actually, next Monday, I think the 26th or 25th, something like that, will be Josh Jacobs' profile coming out. So I did see that. I was super excited. Um, so yeah, really excited too, man. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, um, like, like I said kind of earlier in the show, it's like I thought that there was a problem inherently with yards after contact. I thought there was a, 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 a need to kind of better – better understand offensive line play and the marriage it has with the running back. And because there's such little data, even now, available for college running backs, I just kind of focused on college backs because, like I said, there just wasn't enough college data on running backs. No, there. you're right. There's there's nothing there, – I feel like there's nothing I found that's actually predictive. Like you could look at PFF grades and you could look at their yards after contact and you could look at all that stuff. But at the end of the day, they have guys like Ronald Jones at the top of their list, like last year. And it's just like, you know, I, I want something that's better than that. And maybe since it's so subjective, we might not ever be able to come down to something that's really that great. But what you found in Yards Created has pinpointed a lot of really, really, really good players. So would you say, like, in your honest opinion, that Yards Created is probably the most predictive, I guess, product or service out there right now? I won't say – look, I, I can't on, speak on – Come on, Graham. Come on, I Graham. Can't speak, <laughs> I can't speak on the predictiveness of it like um, because it really is just a three-year sample yeah. um, of, of, of running backs. And, but I will say, I mean, yards credit is because it's not just – I'm not just counting yards per carry and, and the difference between offensive lines, yards blocked, and running backs, yards credit. I'm now doing different things like accounting for missed tackles. Uh, accounting for defenders in the box, accounting for different personnel packages, uh, watching every single pass uh, pass route that's possible, charting pass protection. I think yards created is more, excuse me, more of a holistic like view of a player from all of his different facets. Yeah. So we talked about earlier about having a different mindset and having a long term view. It's like I, I could sit back, man, and, and give you my scouting report on Josh Jacobs. I could give you his pros and cons. I could give you his weaknesses. But what is what makes that any different than Next anyone person, else? Yeah. Like, I would much rather just go listen to Greg Cosell because he posts that stuff for free, and he's been doing this for, like, 50 years, and he has way more experience <laughs> watching film than I do. So I had to have – again, I had to have a contrarian mindset. I have to find a way to make my – knowledge on rookie running backs and my knowledge on college running backs not only 
digestible, but also give it some sort of like analytically facts based information. And that's kind of what I set out to do with Yards Creative is because like, like I mentioned, like anyone can come out with pros and cons and here's my scouting report on this running back. Like anyone can do that. Yeah. But I, finding a way to create digestible information that is either, like you mentioned, funny, uh, entertaining or you know, just you're yeah. learning from it. It's yeah. just pure informational based. Um, I think that's the key. Yeah, I think it's been awesome because, I mean, it's like last year, you know, your top guys are slam dunks and then you've been able to pinpoint guys like the Kareem Hunts and the Alvin Kamara's when a lot of people, you know, that want to look at just speed scores and things like that don't dive into the numbers and, and really look at the things that make players good running backs, like creating their own yards. But let's talk about, like, the logistics of, of yards created itself. Now, you said the inspiration was literally just like you wanted a better way to look at running backs that were coming out. So that's like, you know, that's literally finding a problem in if you want to call the marketplace or whatever and creating your own solution for it. Now, you said it kind of bounced around a couple different homes. And mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about like your relationship with working for the NFL and having this blog uh, by itself, because um, prior to like going full time creating content, I was uh, working at a marketing agency and I was running paid social ads, like uh, Facebook and Instagram ads for e-commerce businesses. I eventually left that and I started running those campaigns with um, my own like personal clients. And, you know, if I would stop running with one of the clients, like I would, you know, you know when you first do that and you're like working on your own, you're like, uh, it's overwhelming because you don't like, sure. you know, you've never been around. I've never had to like make a contract for a client or anything like that. And I had to figure that stuff out by the time I was like 23 years old and they'll come back with like their legal team saying, yeah, well, there's an NDA, after, you know, a non-disclosure agreement and you can't compete or non non-compete clause or whatever they have in there. Right. So like. Uh, the reason I'm getting into this is because uh, I, I I would assume that the NFL would have wanted the content that you're going to create with yards created like to themselves, and that's not the case, I guess. Yeah, no, that was not the case, um, and I, I just kind of when we were going through the the contract motions like last year, I made it very clear up front like either you guys want yards created and I will keep it full time there or I'm going to go and do my own thing. I made it very clear. Like you have two choices. I'm not going to just write on NFL and you guys kind of own it, but kind of not, or I'm just going to take it and do it my own way. And I mean, I, I think throughout my career, I've just found ways to, to do things my own way. And it just kind of made, it made sense to house it on my, on my own site. And okay. um, it's pretty cool now too. I mean, like, um, because I've, because I've moved around and, and worked at different places, like I said, it, it was at Rotor World when it first started and, um, and then, you know, went to Guru. So now I'm just trying to keep it on, you know, its own platform and have it be, have it be its own thing. Yeah. Uh, and now it's kind of opened me up because I'm at the NFL. It's kind of, there's no pressure to, to have it on site at the place I work. It's kind of opened me up now to, to, you know, eventually have it be its own thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think I kind of want to like touch on that, but you know, you said you, you kind of gave it like an ultimatum, and I think you know that's that's a, a positive that comes from you have the leverage when you have a personal brand, right? Because they start needing you once you're able to build that, and you say, hey, like, listen, this is this is what I really enjoy, so you have to be flexible with me if I want to be flexible with you. So you talk about like yardscreated.com. Would you consider yourself um, in, in, like an entrepreneur? Like, do you have a lot of entrepreneurial traits or tendencies? I would say at my like if if you were just if you were to ask me like what is my main motivational driving force of my career it's that I'm just an entrepreneur. Really? And I have, okay. Yeah, I have very strong opinions on things, but I keep them very loosely held. Um, I learned that from um, a guy who is no longer on Twitter and no longer posting and, and writing, but he's literally my favorite fantasy analyst of all time. You went by at, at fantasy douche. And it's a funny name for him, is, but yeah. he's literally the sh what, probably the sharpest writer I've ever read, um, and have had been lucky enough to have a few like personal conversations with him about how he views fantasy, how he views the NFL, and how he views the world. And he made this this comment in one of his columns once. It was like, in fantasy and in life in general, it is smart to have strong opinions on things but hold them loosely. So basically, if you're go into a business, go into a situation, go into whatever it may be in life you should have some sort of conviction to what you're doing. But if new information becomes available that says you shouldn't be doing this thing or you're being inefficient with your time or your money, you've got to be able to realize that you're doing something wrong and change it. 
And I think that what makes a good entrepreneur is just that. Like you've got to have conviction in your ability and in your in your takes and in the information that you provide, whatever the case may be. But if you're wrong and you're doing something wrong or you notice that there's a problem in your process or a problem with your mindset, you've got to be able to change that strong opinion and tweak it to conform and make it better. Yeah, and I you're think gonna lose. Exactly. And that that's basically kind of kind of my overall perspective of my career is like I want to have an entrepreneurial mindset that is a little bit different from from everyone else. Okay. Yeah, it's a cool way to look at it. Um I remember fantasy douche. This was when I first like first started kind of getting in. I probably <laughs> so fantasy douche without laughing, by the way. Dude, I know that that's what made it so epic. It was such like a good marketing move because at the time everyone was so like, you know, shirts buttoned up and pants tucked in in the fantasy industry and then you have fantasy douche like running around like being the goat on twitter what made, what made his twitter persona so much funnier too is like he had the he had like a old scholar as like his uh as his twitter avatar and he was so yeah it's stupid. coming back to me now <laughs> yeah he was such a dick on twitter while everyone is so like pc and like i don't know whatever like that's his own personal brand but i i loved how he he had a different mindset and he started yeah. wrote as in like it, they crushed yeah I mean, so anyway. yeah wrote is cool um so yeah, and, and the reason I bring that up is because like, okay, so you've created, you know, you've created, your heart's created, and you said eventually it's gonna turn into its own thing. I think that's gonna be much sooner rather than later as like people with audiences start to realize that, you know, this is a great resource. And I always, always, always cite your work when I'm doing, you know, run, running back analysis and tell people to go check, uh, you know, check it out. Do you have um, any future plan? like? I want to know if if you're even looking at it from like a, a, like almost a business perspective in itself. I know it's just like a blog and you go on there and post stuff, but like, you know, maintaining and running that and then eventually you'll get big enough or maybe you'll have advertisers come and, and talk to you. Like, but talk to me about I, that. I, talk about, I know where you're going with this. I'm glad we're talking about this. Keep going, please. No. Okay. Yeah. No, no. I wanted to know, like, did, did you have, yeah. like, what did you have in mind when you started the blog? Because there's, you know, you, in today's day and age, if you're getting, going to get enough traffic with that, you can, there's a lot of opportunities that open up. Yeah. You know what good entrepreneurs do? What's that? They work for free a lot. Agreed. They work for free a lot. Mm -hmm. They, they give out information and, and find new ways to exploit new types of business. And my goal with, with Twitter and with Yards Created is, I'm going to get this information for free because over the long term, it's going to lead to more followers, more subscribers to my site if I'm working at a subscriber-based site, um, more readers to wherever I'm working, more viewers on my podcast, whatever the case may be because I'm giving away so much for free that you feel invested in, okay, because I've gotten so much information from free from Graham, I'm going to go in and, and actually be more invested in what he's writing. Yep. Um, and I think to that point, there's, there's still like, I've gotten lucky now to a point where I can kind of sit back and actually make some business decisions, but I still will always give away a ton of stuff for free. And I will always give yards created away for free because I still view it that way. I view it as an information source. I don't view it as anything else at, at its core. I think it's an information source. And, um, yeah, because I've kind of, given a lot away for free and it's it's helped my career in a lot of different ways i'm going to continue to do that yeah i think um i mean that's a great point i, I think that's that should be like ingrained in people's head especially when you're starting out you have absolutely no shot of selling information because the amount of quality information that's out on the web right now that is free will yes. mean that no one will ever pay for yours so the, I, i'm the same way like for two years of putting out youtube videos like obviously i was not trying to sell a single product and then one time i was like you know what what if i create like a draft guide and sell it for like five dollars and see if my followers want to buy it and to my surprise i never sold anything online before but a lot of people bought it and it was because they felt invested in me maybe they didn't think that my con content was going to be any better but it's just like they had been and especially with like video it's such a strong personal relationship that you get with the person that it transfers over so yeah i mean i'm listen i i will i will purchase yards created if you ever do put it up for sale but i appreciate you keeping it for free yeah no you hit the nail on the head man it's it's cool because it sounds like we have i mean literally you and i we exchanged twitter dms and instagram dms a few times but we have never like sat down and talked yeah um you and i have a pretty similar mindset it sounds like i mean you have a different avenue for it through youtube and instagram and that's awesome yeah but you meant you nailed it. it it really is like if you create a value mechanism within whomever you're trying to target it can be the fantasy industry or literally any other business 
you have to incentivize your customers to keep coming back to you. And for me, that's the way I always viewed it. It's like if I give away enough for free, it will give the people that are following me not only like, oh, wow, he's giving this stuff away for free. He's working for free. He doesn't have to do that. I want to follow that. But it also incentivizes them to keep following and to keep reading my work over the long term. And that's, that is the way to, I think, sustainably build a brand. 100%. Because when you're looking over the long term, like short term things that ha happen, these hiccups, if, if YouTube were to crash or something, like obviously I'd be in kind of deep shit, but I've been able to kind of build up audiences in, in other places so people would remember me and they remember you for your brand they don't remember you for your sit start column that you did in week eight or something like that like you brought up and i kind of want to talk about like something else i, I probably should have just brought up before when you're talking about college i find like the whole like education system kind of like fascinating right now in the sense that it, it relates to like personal branding because it do you think that you need to go to college outside of um, knowing exactly if you know exactly what you want to do at age like 17 or 18 and you know that college is the path to do that? Would you say that it's still like worth doing the way that like the loans are kind of piling up or like is personal branding the way to kind of get to it? Because I almost feel like I almost feel like in 10 years there are going to be people because because I really think that like personal brand is so valuable now and people aren't really understanding it. But if you build a company, right, if, if, if you build Yards Created to a, a, a huge monumental thing, right, it has a million followers or something on Twitter, people would literally probably pay you to write for Yards Created because it gives them so much leverage on a personal brand status. Like what are just your overall thoughts? It doesn't really need to be anything like political in terms yeah. of education, but no, I, so it's funny, I have a very close and intimate relationship with this because at the time I was coming up, I was going through college. Um, I was living off like, you know, my number fire money, which at the time just wasn't much. Uh, yeah. It was just kind of like <laughs> enough to make gas and, uh, and pay a little bit of my bills and, and uh, buy some food. Um, I do think you have to go to college still because of the system and because of the way the American system is, is set and rigged frankly, uh, yes. you have to have the ticket to get in. You, you've got to have your degree and that is the ticket to get into a lot of places. So for a lot of people, um, they have to take out the loans. They have to, they have to, they have to go to school to get a job. Um, but I will say in my time in college, I never went to class. I mean, I'll, I'll just straight up tell you, like I, I went to maybe 50% of my classes in college just because I didn't view it as valuable. I didn't view that the, the information that the professors were spewing or giving the same lecture for the last 15 years, I can get all of that information on my own, either through the textbooks that they provide or on Google. So I would just literally get B's and C's, write you know, all of my fantasy stuff, tweet out stats in class and stuff. And, and kind of like you mentioned, I viewed it as like, if I'm going to have this goal, this long-term goal of being a successful fantasy analyst, analyst in the industry and having a full-time job doing it, I knew that I had to know what was valuable in my life and know what was not. And college degrees are such an interesting qu equation because in general, they're very, very, very worthless. Yes. But because, because they're that ticket to get into a lot of businesses and a lot of, you know, to, to get into training or to get your first job, you have to have, it's a requirement for most businesses to, to for you to have a college education. Yeah. That's the catch 22 is because yeah, Nick, in general, that piece of paper that I have, which, by the way, I have no idea where my degree is. I think my parents still have it, and it's mm -hmm. in Atlanta somewhere. Couldn't even tell you where my degree is at. That piece of paper really is worthless. But the ticket and what it signifies is not. Yeah, it's more about reverse that's engineering it. Yeah, that's the unfortunate part. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, I'm not really one to speak because I, I, I went to college. I graduated. I even got my master's degree and everything. But I look back on it, and I'm like, like, I don't feel like it was worthless because obviously you develop a lot of personality traits and, and character traits that help you along the way. You know, you'll never look back and be like, I like where I'm at now, but I didn't like doing that part. Like you, you needed every part of that in order to, to get you know, where you're at. So it, it, I don't know. It's just a conversation. I feel like more people need to have the other thing too, I guess, looking at it from what, like the, the way I phrase the question was it's, it's a little, <laughs> it's a little naive to say one or the other. Cause it's, it's, you can't, it, it, I feel like personal brands for the most part, are almost always natural. The ones that are long lasting are always yep. natural in a sense. Like you can't just be like, I'm gonna skip college because I'm gonna 
start a personal brand. It's like, no, nah, it's like you just love something and you find a way to give that value and passion to other people. And that's how it builds. So this is a great, this is a great um, segue to this. Like one of my good friends out here, um, I've known him since I went to college and actually I knew him a little bit in high school. He was a swim instructor in Jacksonville at like a place called Planet Swim making like $10 an hour. A year ago, I actually moved out to L.A. before I did, um, and he never went to college, never saw the point in it. He just wanted to be a swim coach. He wanted to eventually work for either, like, you know, a college or a high school or work on an Olympic team. And um, he moved out here to, to go after a new opportunity, work at a new school. And this past week, like, literally just worked at the Junior Olympics here in L.A. Wow. Um, I mean, so there are ways in this country because – we still are a free society, and I, ha I have said, yes, life is not a meritocracy, but if you're good at what you do, the right people will find you. That's still true, mm -hmm. and you don't have to go to college to follow your passion. It can be being a swim instructor, being a fantasy analyst, owning your own business. If you have an idea and you have a long-term plan, over the long run, the right people will find you. Yeah, I 100% I agree with that. It's just, you, you gotta give yourself the at-bats to be found too. And it's like, for the audience out there too, like if you haven't even gotten to college yet, the earlier you start, the better. The first year or two years, like you said, when you started writing and you look back at your tweets and stuff, I was the same way, like, oh my God. Like, how did anybody- It's embarrassing, man. Like, it's I'm so like, embarrassing. Oh, it's embarrassing. I'm like, oh my God, like I thought like this? Like I know, yeah. and like, why did anyone follow me? And, and I- Yeah, exactly. Like, why, how did I even get here? If I was this bad this early, like, why, why how did I even get here? But yeah. I'm That's the thing, but like, everyone has it. No one goes from zero to- like Matt Berry, you know, overnight. It's like you have to start there. And if, if you're going to go through college, why not do something you're passionate about on the side? You don't have to do it 12 hours a day. Do it one hour a day. And over a year span, you just put in 365 hours on something. And I guarantee you, you will see some sort of results. So like for the people out there, stop watching this interview. Go start a blog or something. Like you'll be able to get results probably quicker than you think. And, and you'll That's get... Yeah, go, that's, go. A, that's a perfect way to view it is like uh, oftentimes a lot of people don't know how to start and that's literally the first thing you have just start just yeah. do it see if you're any good at it if you suck again strong opinions loosely held move on to something else pivot yeah pivot. there's no there's no problem in failing in life like so many people go through life afraid to fail and afraid of rejection if you live like that you're most likely going to forego a lot of opportunities and, and pathways and um, new lines of thinking that could have opened up along the way. You're just going to regret a lot of things too. And I think a lot of the drive I have, a lot of, not a lot of it, I would predicate like 99% of the things I do, not even, you know, that I've been successful, but anything I do, any choice I have that's like relatively serious in, in my, in my life, I, I would just step back and I say like, when I'm 35, when I'm 40, like, am I going to regret this? Even if it's a really dumb decision at the time, if I'm like, I'm not, I'm going to regret not doing this. I will, I will make the decision to do it. And I feel like a lot of people need to do that because there's not a lot of things worse in life Dude. than like living with regret, you know? Yeah, this is like talking to a mirror, I swear. Like that's the exact way <laughs> I felt at 18. Like yeah. I was telling my mom one day because she, she, she kind of didn't understand it. And, you know, she, she was always like, you got to get your education. She's, she didn't go to college. So she always saw the value. Um, my mom instilled that value of like, because I didn't go to college and I didn't have these opportunities because I didn't go to college. My son needs to go to college and I respected the hell out of that and went to college because of that reason. Okay. But in that same time, like, yeah, I, I went to college at 18 and I was asking myself, like, if I don't pursue this full-time fantasy thing now, even with very, very little money in my pocket, I have no responsibilities and I'm 17, 18 years old. Why not go after this now and see where it takes me? And if I suck and if I fail, at least I have a college degree to back up, like go back on. At least I'll have, at least I can look back when I'm 25, 26 and be like, shit, I, I tried. Yeah. You know, at least I gave it a shot. Yeah. I, that's, that was my mindset as well. It's very true. And you, you developed that at a pretty young age too, because I didn't really think about this seriously until I was probably, I think, out of college. Because then that's, I think that's a, a turning point for a lot of people as well, because you get out of college and you quickly, you know, dive into whatever that next thing is, whether it's grad school or whether it's a full-time job or whatever, right? And that changes your mindset. You're like, oh, shit, there's only a few things that I have time to really give my, my energy and my priorities to. And if it's not something that you like, you're going to spend the, the majority of your day doing stuff that you hate. And that's not how you want to go through life. So, like, my, I was the same way. I was, my mom uh, didn't go to college. But she never, like, pressured me or pushed me to go to college. She had always... Um, 
like back me up with whatever I wanted to do. She's always like, all right, as long as you're happy and as long as you like work hard and, and, and you know, go for it. Like, I don't want you a little bit of regret either. So I, w- I was very, very fortunate to have, um, to have my mom in my life and, and have been like that emotional support for me. I think there's probably a lot of people out there that don't. There's a lot of people out there who, you know, their circle around them, whether it's their friends or their parents that look at something like this, if they were to start trying to do something tomorrow, would look at it negatively. And to be honest, like, it's not easy. It's like a lot of people deal with that stuff in the beginning. And like, I'm not going to sit here and have too much practical advice for you, but the sooner you can get those people, I don't want to say out of your life because some of those people are going to be your parents, of course, but yes. those aren't the people you need to be listening to. You have to have tunnel vision. Yeah. I mean, negativity begets negativity. And if you have negative people surrounding you, you're most likely going to be a negative person. If you don't have a negative mind, if you have a negative mindset, more than likely you're going to surround yourself with negative people. And you're, you're right. There's so many people across this country, across the world that are in terrible situations. They have, they grow up in way worse off parental you know, environments than, than I had, or way worse off, um, you know, living situations than I had. But if, if you have tunnel vision, you have a mindset of like, I'm going to get out of this situation or I'm going to make something of myself and I'm going to do it my own way. You, like you mentioned, it really is kind of like having tunnel vision. Yeah. It really is. I mean, cause if you're, if, if you don't have tunnel vision, if you don't go all in, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to, it's not going to come to fruition. It's very hard sure. to ch- pick and choose between. And even like you were saying, you were in class and you were, you know, tweeting out fantasy stuff or writing about fantasy. By the time I worked at my last full job, and when I left my job, I was I was planning on going into the marketing field and working for myself. But like ninety percent of the time, I was just focused on trying to do like some sort of fantasy content, and it just like eats at you to the point. And if you're ever in that situation, like that's when you know to jump. You know what I mean? Like that's when you know to do it because listen, if you do jump and it doesn't work, you're not going to regret it. The only thing you're going to regret is, is not making that leap to go for what's like eating at you every day. You know. Yeah, that's well said, man. Well yeah. Said. So let's let's take a let's take a step back because I know that got that got real deep there for a minute. Um, <laughs> hope, I hope the audience got some value from that. But let's talk about you know just working at the NFL, like the NFL.com. That's that's a big. I know you don't like titles and whatever, and, and you you show a lot of humility. So I'm assuming it's not like something you go out and, and boast about. But that's pretty cool for a 24 year old. Um, what is it like working there? You said you go into the office and film the podcast uh, on Wednesday morning and stuff. Do you see a lot of like big name personalities and you get like starstruck? Uh, yeah, yeah. Not gonna lie, like the first time I ran into Reggie Bush, I got I got starstruck just wow. because I followed him so closely at USC and through his career. I mean, he's just incredible. He would have been pretty good on yards created, huh? Yeah, he would have been a badass. Yeah, <laughs> I to get to it then. Um, but yeah, of course, like. It's, it's hard not to because for me, like I followed it so closely and like when you run into Willie McGinnis who literally looks like he could go play for the Rams like right now still, yeah. <laughs> it's wild. It's, it's really cool. But it's also like, again, it comes down to your mindset. Like it's super humbling. You know, I'm just, I'm originally a kid from Boone, North Carolina. Like I grew up, I, I grew up in the mountains. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. I'm truthfully, like kind of just a normal dude. So if you have this sense of like, humility and like holy shit this is so cool and reggie bush just walked past me and oh there's scott hansen who i've watched on red zone for the last 10 years like crazy he works so close to me that's really cool and really crazy and just i'm i just feel so fortunate and so uh blessed to have this experience yeah but at the same time i mean you're there for a reason too you know it's not like you're beneath them you're doing just as good as work and as much work as they are so you just have to kind of keep that mindset as well yeah i, I yeah i do i trust me i do but in being in fantasy it's like it really is kind of a different world um, because fantasy is will always be viewed lesser than just real football analysis. That's yeah. just the case. That will, Nick, that will always be the case. Okay. I don't care. We're talking about this in 2019. We can talk about this again in 2029. I think you're wrong. Fantasy will never be viewed at the same level or gambling or DFS will never be viewed at the same level as the real life football analyst. That's just facts because most of the time, the decision makers just don't understand it. They don't understand the value of fantasy advice or gambling. Uh, you don't, you don't think someone's going to break through in the industry? We have a lot of smart dudes on Twitter that I feel like are, are putting a dent in and year after year. someone there, It takes one tweet that is... Mark, mark my words, it will not be at a huge brand. Someone will get it right doing it on their own, owning their own company, and we'll start our own like 
I don't know. We'll, we'll have a network where it's just run by fantasy analysts. I don't know what it'll be. It's not going to be the next two to three years. It's, this is five, six years from, from, from now out. But it's going to be someone's going to have an idea and run it on their own and, and go crazy with it. Well, I was going to uh, say, it, it just takes one one uh, Evan Silva tweet that Jim Ursay somehow sees. And he's like, whoa, what, why don't we bring this guy in for consultant? And then Evan Silva's like, yo, I know this guy, Graham, who's really good. I, I feel yeah. like you know, over the next five to seven years, with just how popular it is, like that's not yeah. out of the realm of possibilities. Well, for sure. I, I mean, we just saw it's the Raiders, and John Gruden still runs that team. But Mike Mayock <laughs> is now the GM of the Raiders, and Mike Mayock is a great dude. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's very, very good, and put, puts in the time for his craft, and d- actually deserves the chance. I mean, Daniel Jeremiah is going to be next. There will be more runover um, and crossover between, um, I, I think, analysts and analysts getting important decision-making roles at a club level that's good i like that yeah um you know well you say that the fantasy will always be below the nfl and i can i like i can totally understand like why you feel that way especially you working there and me working at my desk so you probably know a little bit better than i do but i had uh, i had james co who was formerly of the nfl network on for this interview series uh i think last summer and i had asked him about like does the NFL look at integrating more stuff for fantasy into the game itself? Like, obviously, you know, it's a lesser uh, version of football to them, but like they have to understand that they're sitting on a gold mine here. No. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Um, I I won't go too much into specifics, but there's going to be some new um, apps and programming to come out in the next couple of years that are really exciting for fans. Um, And yeah, I mean, I, I think there is deep down like that, they know that there's this incentive platform to build fantasy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it's just like there, there's a lot of opportunity to to innovate, in, in my opinion, yeah. whether it's like at the live games. Because nowadays, like 90% of the fans, I would rather be at home watching Red Zone, you know, because of my fantasy team than actually at the stadium. I love going to the stadium, but like I would imagine that's the way that probably a lot of, you know, millennials feel as well. So um, if they don't kind of adapt to the times, you know, they're the NFL and super big and powerful, but like that, that's – it, that goes for any business, right? The market will get you. So kind of cool to hear that they're, they're innovating. I know you can't, I guess, divulge any details right now, but um, mm. s- stay tuned, folks. It's coming. Um, and I think that kind of wrapped up most of the questions I had for you. I feel like we covered a lot, anywhere from, from life down to fantasy and, and everything in between. Uh, I, I usually like to leave the audience with um, one maybe piece of actionable advice that you have for them that maybe we didn't touch on throughout the interview. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I, I kind of like hinted at it before, um, earlier in the show is like, I guess for me, my, my biggest thing is I just always want to have a different mindset than people. And, um, I will say just being contrarian is not just having a unique, unique idea or being really smart. And it's also not wise or smart to be contrarian just to be contrarian. You should not be taking the different mindset just to do it just for the sake of it. Um, I think a good contrarian and a good entrepreneur arrives at his or her solution independently of other people's thoughts. They consider all viewpoints and all thoughts on the matter. And then they also resist pressure from the outside to conform to their ideas. Um, And if you have an idea that um, either to to make college running back scouting better, uh, to make start set advice better, to make any product or anything better, Follow that. Follow your own intuition. And if you're wrong, so what? You're wrong. Learn from those mistakes. Don't let your failure consume you and move on and learn from it. Um, again, like you don't always have you don't have being a contrarian isn't about being the smartest you know, man or woman in the room. It's just about trusting yourself and not following what everybody else has set out for you. Fade the public, baby. Fade the public. There you go. Yeah, that's the motto. All right. Well, you heard the man. That is Graham Barfield. Um, I want to say big, big, big thank you for coming on to the show. And this was an awesome interview. Definitely one of my most enjoyable ones thus far. Um, let the people know where they can find you, anything new that you're working on that they can look forward to. Sure. Thank you, for, first and foremost, too, because this has been like definitely one of the cooler interviews I've done. Uh, it's kind of like opened up a lot of different thoughts and pathways. So, um, cool. so I think we got I think we got to some cool stuff in here. So thank you, man. Um, sure. I'm on Twitter at Graham Barfield. Um, you can follow all of my work on NFL.com slash Barfield. I think it's slash Barfield. Wow. That's uh, you nice over there. 
Uh, go to yardsgreater.com. I will be pumping out content starting next week, like March 25th, that Monday, 26th, for Josh Jacobs. And then, yeah, have a couple profiles. We'll do some post-draft stuff, have a few podcasts. It's going to be fun. Awesome. Looking forward to your work, man. Yeah, same to you, man. Thank you so much. For sure. All right, peoples. Well, you heard the man. Go follow him. I'll link all that stuff down below. His Twitter's been hanging down over there, so you should have already followed him. Go check out his work at yardsgreater.com and nfl.com. Go follow him. Uh, hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the channel. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. And we'll see you back here next Monday. Peace.